2012 Paralympic Games had a huge influence on perceptions of disability, both from an international and from a New Zealand perspective. And I've got a couple of the, the stats here. It broke records for attendance. It broke records for coverage. Um, double Paralympic champion Johnny Peacock described it as really the first step of starting to normalise disability and being treated as sports people. How did it end up being so important? Um, yeah, it's, it, it was important from so many reasons. And, and when you think about at the outset when London were awarded the Games, um, they, they took a, a concept of turning what was literally a toxic wasteland um, into a vibrant you know, area of East London. So that, that's where I think it really started. Um, from, you know, as you, you reach out and broaden out, you know, from the Paralympics point of view, the International Committee, it was important and it was bringing the Games home. Um, you know, Stoke Mandeville was where the, the Paralympics um, was, was born, really. Um, and, and bringing it back to the UK um, was a significant um, milestone or event in our history. Um, for you know the the games themselves, and you know the, the reference that that um, you referred to with Johnny Peacock and many others, um, the, it galvanised the city, um, it galvanised the country, and um, the interest of the likes of Channel Four just took the broadcasting to a complete new level, um, and and they did it. Um, with a bit of humour, um, you know, I remember arriving in London um, between the Olympics and the Paralympics and Channel 4 had put up billboards that said, thanks for the warm up, um, which, you know, was, you know, tongue in cheek, um, but it, it really, I guess, it got the locals thinking about, well, what's next? Um, and we've seen over that time, um, you know, a number of Paralympians worldwide, but particularly in the United Kingdom, how they are now very much household names with every other, you know, Olympian um, from the UK. Do you think before, and you mentioned Stoke Mandeville being the original um, Paralympic Games happening in England, um, do you think before London 2012 that British people actually realised their Paralympic heritage? Um, broader public, probably not. Um, you know, those within the Paralympic movement and the, the Brit British Paralympic Association and sport more generally, yes, I think they did. Um, and, and it certainly changed perceptions um, for the public. Um, I think Lord Seb Coe summed it up really well at the end of the Games and, and he said something along the lines of, um, we'll never view sport in the same way again, and we'll never view disability in the same way again. And I'm not sure if he realised at the time what that would mean, um, but you know, he and his team had certainly delivered something quite unique, um, and the flow-on impact that that had. And you know, we witness today there's one million more people in the UK with a disability that are in employment now that weren't. Um, you know, pre-London 2012, and those those recruiters and employers um, quite openly say that, you know, it was the games that opened our eyes and opened our minds and changed our perceptions, and, you know, that has got to be good for society. So mm. may not have beforehand, but it certainly has post, and I think it continues today. So we have this incredible catalyst happening. The face of London is changing. The culture of London is changing. The attitudes to disability in the UK are changing. What was going on back home in New Zealand at the time? What was it like here? Um, I think you know, New Zealand was at a different stage um, and, and possibly still is to some degree. Um, but I think also what happened over that time is that we were starting to get some known names in New Zealand, New Zealand Paralympic sport had come out of Beijing. Um, and and then what was going into London? You know, Sophie had made her her debut in Beijing. Uh, Sophie Pasco, our yes, our sorry, yes, most successful <laughs> correct, Dame Sophie. Um, and you know, Cameron Leslie, you know, had had started to shine um, also in Beijing, as had others. Um, and awareness of para sport and Paralympic sport had started to grow. 
um, the media interest had lifted. I think you know being in a in a um, you know an English speaking nation and being in the UK probably also had some appeal um, to the New Zealand audience um, and just that you know heritage and connection. Um, and it really lifted. You know, it certainly lifted the profile of of para sport within New Zealand, um, and it lifted the profile of individual athletes. That you know, which has you know continued on and been a really good thing, you know, for others to follow steps. So there you were. You you gone from being this um, wonderfully successful Paralympian, and you were named chef de mission. What did that mean to you? Um, it, was, it was super special. Um, you know, I, coming off being an athlete, you know, and you think, you know, yeah, I ended my swimming career, you know, many years prior to that, thinking that was as good as it gets, top of the world stage. Um, and I was super wrong about that. Um, and that's, yeah, while it was great, don't get me wrong, um, being able to then take that into the movement and the organisation and particularly into a New Zealand team, um, and the pride and honour of being able to lead a New Zealand team was something really unique. Um, I was fortunate enough that um, I had led the team into Beijing. Um, and it's funny, really, because you, you think about, you know, as the sort of team management and leader the, of the group is, you know, you're at the forefront and, you know, ahead of where athletes are. But you, know, you could that not be further from the truth. And that, you know, we were really scrambling to to keep up with, you know, the demands and expectations and right demands of athletes and what they need in environments to perform. Um, and so we're learning as fast as what athletes are delivering to us. And it was, it was fantastic to be able to have the opportunity to take those learnings out of Beijing and then into London. Um, and, you know, while we, you know, connect with our heritage and our culture when we're offshore um, you know it probably wasn't as prevalent onshore um, so we really tried to you know to utilize that and make the environment feel like a piece of New Zealand on the other side of the world and to be able to bring that culture and heritage through Nati Ranana a local London Maori club um, you know to be embedded within our team and involved um, you know, it, it was just just something quite special, and it and it felt, it just felt, you know, almost like we were in New Zealand, um, and we tried to make it that way because the thing that you want to do for a, a team and and athletes is to take away as many of the distractions as you can, um, so that they can focus on the one thing that they are super good at, um, and avoid all the other noise that goes on um, and that was our role and you know, as I say I was fortunate to, to have a couple of goes at it. Well, having um, been chef de mission in Beijing what were your ambitions for London 2012? Um, the the learns from Beijing was look it went Beijing went well but it was a hard environment you know it was it was just more difficult um, you know in terms of you're dealing with different cultures you know, it's not right or wrong, it's just different. Um, and that communication and, you know, my interpretation of what I thought I'd asked for and what we were getting um, wasn't always the same as what we ended up with. Um, and so the importance of being able to connect with the organising committee very early on. Um, and, and I think, you know, what New Zealanders are certainly well known for is that, you know, we are real, well respected, you know, as a culture. Um, and and particularly for our sport um, and what we do, you know, we certainly, you know, as the phrase goes, punch above our weight. Um, and so, you know, we had performed well in Beijing. Um, we were a potential contender, you know, with the athletes that we're taking into the games and the size of our, you know, of, of our country. Um, there's statistics that they do on all sorts of measures, you know, number of medals, gold medals, medals per capita. Um, and that was one of the things that, you know, we were aware of, um, that we could top that table um, and, and medals per capita uh, would be a pretty outstanding achievement. 
and we managed to do that. But I think more importantly, that was that was a byproduct. Um, it was ensuring that we had the environment right um, when we worked with the organising committee in terms of our location and what you know where we wanted to be. You know, and it's small things. You know, you talk about a village, and it was one of the smallest villages that the games had ever had. Um, it was still large, and when you think about an athlete or anybody in their normal home environment, you don't normally walk two or three hundred metres to get your breakfast in the morning. Yet that's what we expect people to do in a games environment. And, and uh, so it's those subtle, it might not sound a lot, but it's those minor differences that you really try to minimise of, you know, be close to the services that you need and, and want, um, yet be isolated enough so it's not you know, too noisy and, you know, people can rest and, you know, the villages are great, um, but, you know, they're not designed with the greatest of insulation and, you know, some teams and people are there for other reasons, you know, they like to socialise, they like to celebrate, not that we don't like to celebrate, um, but they do it all sorts of hours of the night when athletes are competing the next day. So it was about getting the little things right um, to allow performance. And how did it all come off in the end? How did you feel at the end of your um, as your, your tenure as chef de mission? Um, I, I think I came out of it on a high. Also, you know, a, a games environment is, you know, you basically get by on sort of four to five hours sleep per night for two weeks straight, um, and and you don't even think about it. Um, so there, there's, there's such an adrenaline rush rush of being in that sort of environment. Um, coming out of that, the games were a huge success, and and it wasn't just our own athletes' performance. It's it's what we witnessed in the you know the in the broader games environment. As I say, you know, being on trains, travelling to to other venues, um, the vibe around the UK and particularly in London, the hosting that we had pre games in Wales, you know, the Welsh and the Kiwis are you know we're pretty tight really. Um, and you know they hosted our team going into the games uh, pre-camp, um, so you know they made us feel incredibly welcome. And I think that was an important part of our build-up. But to then be in the um, the the, um, the games sort of central area where you've got the the you had the velodrome, um, we had swimming, and we had athletics all in walking proximity. Um, and to see the spectators there that could not get tickets, um, you know, there was, I can't remember the exact number, but it was, I think it was close to 200,000 people that were in Olympic Park during the weekend of the Games, watching it on the big screen. Um, you know, and every, you know, every second person you passed would ask, you know, have you got tickets for sale? And it was pretty remarkable. So, yeah, we came out of that feeling pretty great. Um, our New Zealand performance was stunning um, and we did happen to to top the medals per capita table which you know it was a, a nice um, accolade to come home with. Do you think that topping the medals per capita table made people sit up and take notice back home? Um, it was probably just a as another you know point um, you know evidence point to demonstrate you know just what um, Paralympics New Zealand were doing on the world stage in the Paralympic movement. Um, so I think it helped. Um, you know, but you know, nothing helps more than you know having you know athletes that then become household names. Um, you know, that that was probably a real turning point for not just the you know society and the public of New Zealand, but also broadcasting. You know, that our broadcasters saw that there's interest in this. Um, great interests, um, and to be able to get on board and ensure that you know we lifted the the visibility and profile of the sports and the individuals. Yeah, absolutely. So ten years on, what what was the impact? Do you think now, looking back, what was the impact of London 2012 on New Zealand? Um, I think you know to that that last piece, you know, the interest in Paralympic sport has certainly lifted, um, and you know the work that we do with Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand also lifted. 
um, and just the the professionalism um, that has gone around sport and and it's not unique to para sport that's similar with all amateur sports you know they they come to a point where you know they they can compete and there's events that are of interest to the New Zealand public on the world stage um, and then they get support and programs so we've certainly gone through that um, and are well in that now um, and I think what that has helped um, do from a New Zealand perspective, but it's also from a global perspective, is that the standard um, of the Paralympic Games has lifted. And as standards lift, interests lift. Um, and so it really set the scene of this is the new benchmark for the Paralympic Games. And boy, what a benchmark it set. Um, and it was a real challenge for Rio being the, you know, the, the next host city. Um, and, and you know, uh, Rio knew it would be different. Just remind our listeners, what was the result coming out of Rio for the team? Um, well, the Rio team, and, and I had nothing to do with that, by the way, um, um, maintained that um, top medals per capita, um, you know, standard. So, you know, the the, the athletes, um, and I think important to, to um sort of acknowledge too the the support structures that go around through high performance sport and Paralympics New Zealand um, helped you know maintain that standard to deliver that and it wasn't a a number or a um, a pressure that we put on the team but it was just one of those satisfying things if we can come away with this you know two games running wouldn't that be something quite unique it sure was so uh, wonderful to look back at this piece of of New Zealand's Paralympic heritage of um, looking back at the at what was achieved in London 2012. What do you think is going to come out of Paris 2024, our next Paralympic Games? Yeah, well, I think um, it's unfortunate. Um, it'd be nice to wind back the clock a couple of years because um, we were all expecting, and it would have happened. Um, Tokyo would have been would have set a new standard. You know, it was the 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 UK or the London equivalent in Asia where they would have showcased the games to an incredibly high standard. Um, and they were well prepared. Uh, it was just unfortunate we didn't have an audience um, in person. Um, that had other spin-offs. It had a, a greater um, broadcasting audience because people had less to do over that time, I guess. Um, but I think you know, now going into Paris, you know, Paris are very, very aware of ensuring that you know, the games are of equal splendour. You know, it's not about replicating what the Olympics are, but it's ensuring that there is a quality in terms of how the events and what is delivered in the events. Um, and I think we'll see, or no think, we will certainly see some spectacular you know, imagery and backdrops um, that will just enhance, um, not that it needs it, but it will enhance the, the imagery to some pretty spectacular sport. Um, you know, we saw more um, countries compete in Tokyo than ever before, um, and we fully expect we'll see more countries again compete in Paris in 2024. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for your insights. That's been a, a really great um, look back and look forward. Um, from your perspective, uh, from the both the vice presidentship of the IPC and also on the board of Paralympics New Zealand. My pleasure. Thanks, Sue.